In this video, I'll be talking about your treatment options for stage one breast cancer, including what is stage one breast cancer and what are your treatment options in terms of surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, endocrine therapy or hormonal therapy and targeted therapy. Stage one breast cancer means that while the disease, yes, is invasive, it's very early stage. In order to classify as having stage one disease, the tumor needs to be less than two centimeters, not inches, but centimeters. So an inch is two and a half centimeters, and this needs to be much less than that. In addition, the lymph nodes need to be negative or have an area that's less than two millimeters. So if you imagine taking a grain of rice, breaking it in half and looking at the cross section of that, you can have lymph node involvement with that little amount. That makes it stage one disease. Now, of course, if you've just had a biopsy and pictures of the breast with an ultrasound or a mammogram or maybe an MRI, which is not necessary, but some women have had, that's the clinical stage. That's what we know about when you walk into the office or into the clinic. When you proceed with surgery, then we'll have the pathologic stage. We have the whole pathology report, and they're not always the same. So it's important to know that the clinical stage, what you're told you have before surgery, and the pathologic stage can be different. The prognosis in stage one breast cancer is generally excellent. Nonetheless, we take it very seriously, as you'll hear about in just a moment. Depending on what the tumor's personality or biology is, we may or may not treat it with more or less of our tumor treatment option. So you have clinical stage one breast cancer, now what? So now you will have an assessment of your lymph nodes, which has already been done in part by your clinical exam. If they're not palpable, that's clinical stage one breast cancer. Ultrasound, maybe an MRI. And then at the time of surgery, you will also most likely have a sentinel lymph node assessment or sentinel lymph node biopsy. They're basically the same thing, at which time the surgeon will inject either and a radioisotope and or a blue dye. And once they do that, they identify what I call the sentry or sentinel lymph node, the first lymph node or lymph nodes that drain the breast. So the lymph nodes guard the breast just like they do in our neck when we have an infection. That's the first node or nodal packet, which I'll describe in just a second more, and they take those out, those nodes that take up the blue dye or the radioisotope. Then we do a very detailed examination of those lymph nodes and make sure those aren't involved with cancer. If there are no cancer cells in there, those lymph nodes are negative. So if those lymph nodes are negative, you're done with your lymph node surgery, and now your surgeon will proceed to finish up the surgery on the axillary lymph nodes or the lymph nodes in the armpit and will proceed with the breast surgery. You've already discussed with your surgeon what kind of breast surgery you'll have. Most women can have a lumpectomy, removal of the tumor and an area of normal tissue around it, which we call a margin. Some women choose to have a mastectomy. We'll address that in another video, but either of those are reasonable options. Mm -hmm. So now you've had your surgery and we've confirmed that the tumor is two centimeters or less and that the lymph nodes are negative or just maybe have a small area involved. And if, like most women, you've had a lumpectomy and kept the breast, you will proceed to radiation therapy. This is the standard of treatment for women who have had breast preservation surgery or a lumpectomy. They're the same thing. Radiation therapy is sometimes given for special cases in women who've had a mastectomy, but that's quite rare. If you have radiation therapy, it's usually given once a day for six weeks, and some women also get an extra couple of weeks called a tumor boost to the area where the tumor was, right along the surgical incision. There's also a type of treatment called accelerated hyperfractionated radiation treatment, where you actually get treatment twice a day for a shorter time, it's sped up. That's why it's called accelerated treatment. You should find out if that's offered in your treatment center and if that works for your lifestyle, if you're a candidate for that kind of treatment. Now, regardless of the kind of radiation treatment you get, you want to know what to expect. Radiation treatment does not make you radioactive. That's a common misconception. 
so you can be around your friends and family. The food you eat doesn't become radioactive. You can be around people who are pregnant, so that's a relief for many people. What you will expect is some sort of a sunburn around the skin, regardless of the level of skin pigmentation you have. That can lead to some tenderness, as you might expect. That usually goes away two weeks or so after you're done with radiation therapy. And it's good to know it doesn't start till you're a couple weeks in either. If your timing of symptoms beginning or ending is a little different, that's okay. The other thing that you might notice is some fatigue. We're not sure exactly why that happens. We think it's just an overall reaction to the radiation therapy. Most people can continue to do their daily work. Some people need to ask for some time off work or some help from family members and friends. That's okay too. The other thing that you'll notice over the weeks following radiation therapy is that your skin may change in color, so it may become a little pink. You may also notice growth of some skin tags. Those will come off your skin and your skin will return to its normal color over time. So when you get radiation therapy, what's it like? Well, the most important thing to know is that the first planning session, which is called a simulation session, is not the same as the daily treatment after that. The simulation is to actually takes a couple of hours. You will lie on your back and the radiation therapist, the physicist, and the doctor who will be treating you will be looking at your body using a CT scan from a different room. You'll be quite comfortable on your back with your arm up in something that's called a cradle, and the doctors will plan everything out just perfectly so that they won't radiate normal tissue like your heart and your lung, and they will radiate the breast tissue, which again is done to decrease the risk of the cancer coming back in the normal breast tissue. After that, your treatments are much easier. You'll come in, change into a gown, go into a different room and get your treatment. All of this takes about 20 minutes. It's like getting an x-ray, then you'll get dressed again and get back into your car. You can drive yourself to and from radiation therapy. You can go right back to work or back to your normal activities. You don't need extra medication and you don't need somebody to come with you. So that's really important to know. Next, I'm going to talk about chemotherapy and the treatment of stage one breast cancer. It's really important to know why we give chemotherapy. We give chemotherapy to decrease the chance that cells that might have escaped from the tumor before you were even diagnosed have spread through your body. We wanna treat those cells before they show up in other parts of the body. Do we know that they're there? Absolutely not. We can't even see them on scans. So we're treating you to decrease the chance that they'll ever show up. How do we decide whether or not to give chemotherapy? Well, of course, this decision is made with you. You have to be on board with this and understand it. We also look at things that I call the personality or biology of the tumor. In particular, if the estrogen receptor is not present on your tumor, we're more likely to recommend chemotherapy. If the HER2 protein is present on your tumor, we're more likely to offer chemotherapy. If the grade is higher, for example, a grade three tumor, that's very different from stage. If the grade is higher, like grade three, we're more likely to recommend chemotherapy. And very important, it's to know that if your tumor is sent for a gene assay, there are a couple different brands, and you and your doctor will talk about this, that score will come back in usually one of three categories, low, medium, and high. Now, if it comes back high, that doesn't mean your tumor is going to come back. It just means it has a higher chance of coming back, but even more important, chemotherapy has a better chance of working. There are a couple of tumor types for which we don't do the tumor assay and we don't give chemotherapy. The first is tubular cancer and the second is mucinous cancer. Why don't we do that? Well, these tumors are associated with a very good prognosis the tumor assays don't help us make decisions and chemotherapy isn't given. So once again, tubular carcinoma and mucinous carcinoma. We don't do the tumor assays I was discussing and we don't give chemotherapy, regardless of the tumor size. Now, when you get chemotherapy, how is it given for stage one breast cancer and what should you expect? 
Chemotherapy in the curative setting, which again, remember, is why we're giving chemotherapy in stage one breast cancer. It's to treat cells that we don't know are there, but might be there. And we're trying to increase the chance that you're cured. So you've had your surgery and you might be getting radiation therapy. Chemotherapy is to treat cancer cells that may have spread in other parts of your body. And we want to increase the chance that we never see them again. Chemotherapy is generally given by vein. This can be given in a vein in your arm or in some patients through a port that's generally put in under local anesthesia and then the chemotherapy is given in the port. We try to avoid those, it's one more surgery, but if you have terrible veins and you know you're a quote, a hard stick, a lot of patients will tell me, I'm a hard stick, so I'd like a port. Again, we try to avoid it, complications are rare, but it's one more surgery and one more scar. So in that case, we um, would do a port for you. So chemotherapy is given. You get medications by your mouth. You take pills or liquids if you have a hard time with pills. Those decrease the likelihood that you'll get nausea or vomiting, and they can work for a few days, which is just terrific. You'll also get some pills to take at home to decrease the likelihood that you'll get sick to your stomach. We actually do a very good job of this, and if we don't do a good enough job, you absolutely need to call your nurse or your doctor and let them know you're having side effects. A lot of people think, I'll just wait till I come back. You really need to call in between so we can do a better job next time. You come in, we either access your port or we put a vein in your arm, and then a very specially formulated for you combination of chemotherapy or targeted therapy, which I'll get to in a moment, are given to you over a couple of hours, and then the IV is taken out and you go home. What to expect in terms of side effects, different for every person, different with every chemotherapy combination. So I'm just going to talk about the general side effects that nearly every person sees. The first of these is fatigue. There's nothing like chemotherapy induced fatigue. I want you to be really kind to yourself. If you're a 12 out of 10 kind of energy person, you're probably going to go down to an 8 out of 10. If you tend to be a pretty mellow, lower energy person, you're going to go even lower. So plan ahead. There are two other side effects of chemotherapy that nearly everybody experiences. The first is thinning or loss of your hair. Remember the goal of chemotherapy is cure. So instead of giving just one drug at a time where you might be able to keep your hair, the most effective chemotherapy in the curative setting will most likely cause thinning or entire loss of your hair. This can be very difficult and knowing it's about to come is much more helpful than just pretending it won't. We have an article on our website about how to manage this, what to expect, and ways that might help you avoid this. The other concern a lot of people have is about the cost of chemotherapy. Make sure to talk with your doctor or the doctor's office, a nurse, somebody at the billing office, or somebody at the front desk about cost of chemotherapy. We are very aware of the cost of chemotherapy and the concern that you might have. Don't be afraid to ask. The way we give chemotherapy and the medications to prevent side effects are given in such a way that insurance will cover your chemotherapy. Giving the drugs at home to prevent side effects can be a little difficult, so check with us. We have ways we can alter those to make it less of a financial burden for you. In terms of chemotherapy side effects that are specific for the particular combination you get, those are going to differ according to the specific regimen or combination you get. So if you want to learn more about what to expect and how often the drugs are given, how long your chemotherapy will go in terms of weeks or months, visit yerba.com for a very personalized report on the different chemotherapy regimens that might be offered to you. So next I'm going to talk about targeted therapy, which I mentioned very early on. If your tumor has the HER2 protein or overexpresses the HER2 oncogene, which just means cancer gene, that's a tumor or gene in the cancer cells themselves. One in five women will have this on their tumor. So if your tumor is what we call HER2 positive, you'll get a drug called trastuzumab. One of the brand names is Herceptin. There's also a generic form or a form we call the biosimilar. So how is Herceptin given? Herceptin or trastuzumab is also given by vein, just like chemotherapy. 
We're also seeing it used more often under the skin or subcutaneously, especially in people that we like to avoid having come to the cancer center as often. Now this drug is actually given for a full year as long as you're tolerating it okay. So it will start with chemotherapy, whether that chemo, whether it starts exactly the same day as chemotherapy or begins at the end of chemotherapy. It depends on which chemotherapy you're getting. This medication is very well tolerated in terms of side effects. With the first treatment, we tend to give it over a longer period of time and then to watch you a little bit, make sure you're doing okay before we send you home. After that, once you're done with chemotherapy, your hair actually starts to grow back when you're on trastuzumab, which is a great uh, thing for women to know and be aware of. And it's actually very different from chemotherapy, so you don't get sick to your stomach after you've been on it for a bit. Remember, because it's given with chemotherapy, you may actually think these are side effects of the trastuzumab when they're actually the side effects of the chemotherapy. One thing to know is very rarely trastuzumab can cause heart problems, so we'll follow your cardiac function when you're on trastuzumab, and if it looks like it's doing well earlier on, we'll do the heart test less often. Next, I'm going to talk about hormonal therapy. You might also hear this called anti-estrogen therapy or sometimes endocrine therapy. They're all the same things, and they all work similar ways in that they decrease the amount of estrogen that can get to any remaining cells in your body. We only use this type of therapy if your tumor has the estrogen receptor and or the progesterone receptor. So if your tumor doesn't have the estrogen receptor and or the progesterone receptor, you won't hear about this. These medications are given by mouth once a day. We also may, if you're still premenopausal, recommend that we suppress your ovaries with shots that are given in your doctor's office, or sometimes even with removal of the ovaries. You'll hear more about that in future videos. Endocrine therapy or anti-estrogen therapy or hormonal therapy, like I mentioned, is give a, given once a day by mouth in pill form. Most people actually tolerate the medication very well, but you're going to be on this medicine for as long as five or even ten years or somewhere in between that amount of time. So this is really important for you to talk to your doctor if you're not feeling well on this medicine. Generally, side effects include things like hot flashes or flushes or cold chills at night. The side effects tend to be worse at the three-month point, and then they tend to get better. So if you're having side effects, again, it's really important you work with your nurse practitioner, physician assistant, or your doctor to let them know you're not feeling good. Don't just stop it. Work in partnership with them because staying on the medication is actually more powerful than chemotherapy itself. It can be hard to believe. Chemotherapy seems so powerful. How is hormonal therapy so important? It really is. How do we decide between different hormone therapy options? Well, if you're premenopausal, we can either suppress or remove the ovaries. Then we have a lot more choices between tamoxifen and the aromatase inhibitors. If you're postmenopausal, you have some estrogen in your body, not made by the ovaries, but made by other tissues in your body. Some people find that hard to believe, but it's true. And then we can use the aromatase inhibitors. So the aromatase inhibitors are only an option if your ovaries have stopped working, whether through time or whether because we suppress them either medically or remove them surgically. One concern people do have is about the cost of the medication. Insurance will cover the cost of these medications, and if you have any financial difficulty covering them, we can obtain financial assistance for you for these medications. Don't use cost as a barrier to taking them. Let us help you with those costs. I wish you weren't going through this, but I've really enjoyed talking with you today. If you like this video, hit like and subscribe and write comments about other things you'd like to see.